this picture just to show to um, those of you who are not familiar with Mohlos that it's the small islet just off the coast of uh, North Crete, or, or of the north coast um, of Crete. Um, in, the, in prehistory, it used to be linked uh, with, uh, with the mainland uh, of Crete with a, a small stripe of land. Now you can swim, but um, it's not that close. <clears throat> So, um, Mohlus has played an important role in discussions of the Cretan Early Bronze Age ever since Seeger's excavation of the Prepalatial Cemetery in 1908. Okay. The tomb occupants appear to have belonged to an important trading community specializing in the acquisition, transformation, and exchange of exotic raw materials, imported goods, and local products. While most scholars agree that burials began on the island in the early Minoan to A period and continued through the end of the Prepalatial, there has been considerable disagreement over the dating of individual artifacts to either an early Minoan II or early Minoan III MM1A horizon. This stems in part from Seeger's excavation methods, but also from the communal nature of early Minoan Cretan burials, which have frustrated attempts to match up grave goods with individual burials or define phases of use in the tombs. The recent excavations by Sols and Davaras have taken direct aim at this problem, looking for new tombs and traces of early Minoan houses beneath the later Neopalatial settlement. Material collected during the 2012 excavation season confirms Sigurd's suggestion that habitation began on the island in early Minoan I and this evidence provides a significant sample for understanding the earliest developments at the site in the early Bronze Age. During this first phase of the Bronze Age, several sites on the north coast of Crete, like Poros, Pyrgos, Gurnes, Psyra, Kefala, Petras, and Agia Fotia, reveal particularly strong interaction with Cycladic communities, but the nature of this contact is still not well understood. Trade, colonization, and various other uh, interpretations. The new finds from Mohlos can now be added to this discussion. The history of the new excavation started in 1989 with two small trenches in area D2 and the goal of recovering more prepalatial tombs on the eastern side of the cemetery. However, the finds, including two unrelated early Minoan rooms, do not belong to tombs. We returned to the area in 2012, opening a deep trench next to a room with a small staircase. This work exposed a continuous stratigraphic sequence from early Minoan I to early Minoan IIb, which is unique for both the site and the region. Within a deposit of two and a half meters, we recovered four distinct layers that can be associated with changes in pottery, architecture, and the use of, spa of space. Phase one represents a fill that spans the early Minoan I to the beginning of the early Minoan IIa period and appears to form part, or possibly even the core, of the earliest settlement at Mohlos. Habitation continued in phases two and three, with rebuilding that can be dated to an earlier and later phase of early Minoan IIa, with a clear floor surface associated with phase three. Phase four is connected with the eastward expansion of the cemetery in early Minoan IIb, when a house tomb with Vasiliki ware pottery was built over the earlier dwellings. There is no evidence in the area for early Minoan III and MM1A material, which was found elsewhere on the island, in some of the tombs and houses. That we found the same stratigraphy and ceramic sequences in two separate but adjacent spaces is particularly significant. How does all this relate to this workshop focusing on pottery technology in crisis or in times of crisis? The pottery sequence from Mohlus offers clear illustrations of three different ceramic assemblages, which date to the early Minoan I, early Minoan IIa, and early Minoan IIb phases. Each assemblage is marked by continuities, but also significant changes in fabric recipes, manufacturing techniques, decoration, and exchange networks on and off the island. No less important, these changes in pottery production and consumption can be associated with other significant changes in the local settlement and cemetery. In this paper, we concentrate on the pottery from phases one to three, which cover the period from early Minoan I to 2A. 
Phases 1a and 1b date broadly to the early Minoan 1, early, um, early Minoan 2a, and phases 2 and 3 are broadly EM2a. After reviewing the local context for, it, for each phase, we then turn, to our attention, uh, we turn our attention to the wider picture, integrating Mohlos into the emerging narrative for early prepalatial Crete. We examine whether any of these changes in pottery production and exchange can be attributed to the social, political, and economic changes, potentially a crisis, witnessed in early Minoan 1, early, early Minoan 2a, and early Minoan 2a Mohlos which means that you're going to have, again, four phases <laughs> of the early Bronze Age. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, so, we start from phase 1a, which is uh, the lower deposit in our trench D2. Uh, it represents phase 1a uh, and was distinguished as a pocket of soil that lay beneath the earliest architecture in the area. The ceramic assemblage is rather small and consists of two main fabrics and the third one, which is rather rare. So fabric one is characterized by a red firing, non-calcareous clay and metamorphic rock fragments and that is compatible with the local geology of the Philite quartzite series. Most of the vessels belong to a category of plain red-brown courseware with shapes including thin, flat cooking dishes pierced near the rim jars with solid semicircular handles and two thick square lids pierced at the corners. At this point, I would return uh, to the cooking dishes and they are of particular interest in this discussion. Although one is tempted to identify them as cheese pots commonly found on final Neolithic sites and Simona has already mentioned uh, their significance, uh, these ones are smaller, the rim profiles are also smaller, and they are finer in terms of fabric and surface treatment. They are rather different and most likely they serve cooking purposes. Parallels have been reported from Petraske Falla and their date is EM2A. The second fabric, the one you see here, is rather unusual. It is highly micaceous and that gives the vessels the shiny appearance that is not commonly seen in Cretan pottery. It is more at home in the Cyclades and the East Aegean. Petrographic analysis showed that it is rather homogeneous and contains metamorphic rock fragments and, and, and an increased amount of biotite mica. Unlike fabric one that occurs in a single wear, the micaceous fabric occurs in a broader variety of at least four different wares. Cooking dishes with flat bases and thick and thick pierced rims belong to the plain red-brown coarse ware. A jar belongs to a, a class of impressed ware with patterns of basketry on the exterior, while two jars with rough exteriors belong to the wiped and washed wares. Among the dark burnished wares, there are jars with strap handles and with round horizontal handles. The origin of this fabric is uncertain, and if you have ideas, please let me know. It is not reminiscent of anything we know from Mohlos, and I don't mean just the prepalatial stuff, but also pottery of the later periods that we have analyzed. In the beginning, we were tempted to consider it imported. However, there is no reported parallel from the Aegean, and Dr. Jill Hilditch, who has studied many sites in the Cyclades, has not seen anything like that. Of course, we have not seen everything. We don't know much about uh, the Dodecanese. For this reason, we are considering also the possibility of local production, possibly through the exploitation of a small micaceous deposit within the metamorphic series of Mohlos that we have not located yet. A third, more rare fabric, comprises a burnished chalice, chalice in light gray ware and two dark on light jugs, and is consistent with South Central Crete or the South Coast. And these help uh, date the deposit to early Minoan 1b. Now let's move to phase 1b. Uh, it's a more substantial fill associated with the earliest architecture.
jar, jars with solid semicircular handles, a biconical jar, and the Pyrgos bottle that helps us date uh, the deposit to EM1b. A third group of vessels using this red micaceous fabric belong to the dark burnished ware. The shapes include a chalice with a bulging stem, a goblet, bowls, uh, and two pixies. The other fabric, the red metamorphic, non-micaceous fabric, which is broadly local, also continues in phase 1b, but it becomes less frequent. Among the plain red brown ware shapes are thin cooking dishes with pierced rims and the pithos, while a jar with scored decoration belongs to the wiped and washed ware. A third, very rare fabric that we see for the first time in the prepalatial assemblage of Moglos is the calcite tempered. The few vases produced in this fabric comprise a jar with horizontal lug handle and the tray belongs to the plain. I was just saying about the calcite tempered fabric. Uh, it's rare, it's the first time we see it in the Moglos assemblage and uh, the vessels be belong to the plain red brown ware. However, at this point, I would like to say um, one thing about this fabric. Uh, it, it's commonly found on final Neolithic and early Minoan one sites on the north coast of East Crete, but the distribution is not uniform. They make up less than 1% of the early Minoan 1B assemblage at Mohlos, Prignaticos Pyrgos, Kalochorio, and Petras Kefala. They're more frequent at sites like Halepa in the Gurnia region of the North Isthmus, while in other sites it is the dominant fabric. At Poros, it constitutes 33% and at Mesorahi, 50% of the assemblage. Finally, in cemeteries like Agia Fotia and Gurnes, the calcite tempered pottery comprises more than 95% and the shapes have strong, strong cycladic affinities, particularly with the pottery of the so-called Campos group. Now to uh, finish off this phase for Mohlos, imports from other Cretan sites include dark on light uh, jars and light gray ware chalices made with fabrics consistent with the south coast, as well as uh, a dark on light goblet with close parallels in late EM2A levels at Knossos. The final pair of objects are off-island imports. The first is a cup made with a gold mica fabric painted red, the second is a fine painted sus boat, probably from the West Cyclades. Fine, fine painted sus boats, which are not common on Crete, are found in small numbers at Poros and Knossos in early Minoan 2A levels. Moving to the next phase uh, of Trench D2, phases two and three are associated with architectural changes dated to early Minoan 2A. The wall on the west side of the deposit was rebuilt and a new corresponding wall was built on the east side. Between them, our excavation recovered the lower fill that we call phase two, which was sealed by a later floor level and fill that we identify as phase three. Although there is no sign of violent destruction, fire, collapse or anything, the pottery from phase two reveals significant changes in both local production and imports in early Minoan 2A. In terms of recipes, the pottery of the period is manufactured in two main fabrics. The local red firing, which is connected with a fill light quartzite series using a non-calcareous raw material, and the metamorphic fabric containing silver mica, whose source, local, possibly foreign, is still unknown. The pottery recipes become more standardized and the assemblage is dominated by the burnished wares, red brown and black burnished comprising vessels intended for serving, food and drink consumption, transport, or small-scale storage. In the same category, there is also a highly burnished rectangular hearth. The repertoire of shapes includes various types of jars and bowls, the latter distinguished by the high degree of burnishing and the presence of distinctive horizontal lug handles at the rims, some molded with slightly projecting knobs. A major change in phase two is the introduction and widespread use of vessels in granitic diuretic fabrics, which can be sourced in the region of Gurnia and Prignaticos Pyrgos on the south side of the Mirabello. For those of you who are not familiar 
um, with Crete. In Crete, the geology is rather complex. Uh, due to a, a complex system of, of faults, we have the same series re being uh, repeated across the landscape. In the case of the granitic diuretic uh, um, outcrops, we're really lucky because we have them only on the Bay of Mirabello. So whenever we find granitic diuretic pottery, we'll know exactly where it's coming from. So these fabrics are uh, encountered primarily in plain red-brown wares, and the shapes include fenestrated stands that may have served as cooking vessels, cooking dishes, collar jars, and home mouth jars. Their appearance marks an important shift in local pottery consumption at Mohlus, as Mirabello fabrics would continue to be important with varying intensity until the end of the Middle Minoan to be, which is roughly a thousand years. The new cooking dishes, which replaced the earlier pierced dishes, have this very characteristic profile that you see there. They are very well fired, and their numbers increase with the appearance of the first tripod cooking pots in the same fabric in the next level, which is again dated to the early Minoan way. Together, these shapes represent a major change in local cooking habits that are introduced in this period. The granodiorite fabric is also used at smaller scale for dark on light wares, namely jugs, a trend that becomes more widespread in East Crete in the later prepalatial period. Finally, there is a group of transport jars produced in South Coast and Mesara fabrics and a jug with good early Minoan to A parallels from Knossos. And let's go to phase three. The material from phase three is more restricted in range. A precise date of late early Minoan to A is given primarily because it is sealed beneath a later tomb with large amounts of early Minoan to B Vasiliki ware. In terms of fabrics, wares, and shapes, there is continuity from phase two and some important changes. The local metamorphic fabric is still used used for the red, brown, and the black burnished wares, mainly bowls and cups, but there is change in the appearance of these uh, phase three bowls, which no longer exhibit the highly lustrous surfaces of previous phase two. The granodiorite fabric also continues for vessels in the plain red, brown coarse ware, with a marked increase in the number of cooking dishes and the appearance of two new shapes, the basin and the tripod cooking pot with flat legs. To this group, we can also add a pair of monochrome jugs, a ceramic mold, possibly for bar ingots, which reveals the continued local interest in metallurgy and trade in early Minoan II. Finally, imports from the south coast decrease significantly in numbers. There is only one color jug. jug. No new houses or tombs can be assigned specifically to this period which appears to represent a transition to early Minoan to be and the introduction of Vasiliki ware. The, this major change in pottery production and consumption uh, in early Minoan to be coincided with other major changes, namely the significant expansion of the settlement and the construction of new houses and tombs, inclu including one uh, over the earlier dwellings in area D2. While early Minoan to A witnessed a sharp drop in ceramic imports from the Cyclades, we can be certain that other raw materials, like obsidian, continued to arrive. We found a small obsidian workshop beneath house C7 with 13 spent cores, waste, blades, and two bronze chisels that were probably used to work the cores. Now to sum up what we have seen so far. No more phases. Phase 1A one, one appears to be broadly EM1. The deposit is small, and so far it has not been possible to offer a more precise date within EM1 because none of the markers for EM1A are present in the Mohlos assemblage. For example, the relief pithoi that we have at Aphrodite's Kefali and Kefala Petras. The material from phase 1B is broadly EM1B, early EM2A. These two early phases are quite homogeneous in terms of fabrics, shapes, and wares. Three points um, have to be made. Both phases are characterized by two fabrics, the local metamorphic, used mainly for the plain red-brown coarse wear, and the micaceous. 
The latter is unusual. We are still uncertain about its origin because there are no known parallels and the presence of such high amount of mica is not compatible with the broad geology of Mohlos or with the fabrics that we know from the site. However, we cannot exclude the possibility of a small micaceous deposit within the phyllite quartzite series of the area. There does not seem to be a fabric versus function relationship. All kinds of vessels are manufactured with both fabrics. It is worth reminding that this is also valid for the cooking dishes with pierced rims. The micaceous fabric becomes predominant during phase 1b and continues to be used for many wares. In the same period, the calcite tempered fabric appears for the first time at Mohlos. Although this fabric is found at many sites at cro across Crete, the quantities vary considerably. At Mohlos, its presence is rather limited, and this is a point of interest not only because of the small amount of calcite tempered pottery, but also because in other sites it appears in the final Neolithic and becomes widespread in early Minoan 1a. If we consider the scarcity of the calcite tempered fabric with what at present seems the total absence of its corollary, the grog tempered pottery, Mohlos seems to follow a different pattern than the rest of East Crete and probably the rest of the island. Finally, with regard to Cretan imports, there seem to be a few, and they include primarily painted wares, mineralogically compatible either with the Mesara or the south coast of East Crete. The transition from the earlier prepalatial, the early Minoan I to early Minoan IIa period at Mohlus, is characterized by a marked change in pottery fabrics and shapes, especially those for the cooking wares. This change, as well as the presence of the imported vessels from the Mirabello and the Mesara, brings Mohlos closer to the pattern we see at other Cretan sites. More specifically, the pierced cooking dish is abandoned in favor of the tripod cooking pot. The change in the shape of the vessel might reflect changes in cooking practices. It has been demonstrated that the tempering materials used for the manufacture of the cooking pots affect the thermal conductivity of the vessels, whereas the firing in lower or higher temperatures affects their strength and resistance to, ex and resistance to repetitive exposure to fire. It's the work by Noemi Miller and co-workers. Consequently, different shapes are used for slow simmering of stews or casseroles and others for fast boiling or frying foodstuffs. Therefore, this change might, re might reflect a broader phenomenon of new cooking habits and possibly new recipes that necessitated the introduction of the tripod cooking pot. Cooking pots are among, among the most conservative ceramic shapes. They do not change ev easily over time. The abandonment of an entire tradition of manufacture, raw materials, fabric recipe and shape might reflect the abandonment of everyday habits. Again, Dietary habits and cooking practices do not change easily, suggesting that some kind of crisis, environmental, political, or social, may have been involved. This change in the shape of the cooking pots coincided with the abandonment of the biotite mica fabric that was replaced by the local metamorphic and the introduction of the granitic diuretic ceramics. A generalized shift towards the production of the Mirabello is seen across East Crete, and this brings Mohlos closer to its contemporary sites on the island. This trend in early Minoan IIa ushers in an exchange pattern that continues to thrive through middle Minoan IIb. The low presence of calcite tempered pottery in early Minoan IIa is a phenomenon that necessitates further study and comparison with other prepalatial assemblages from Mohlos. While calcite temper is found in varying amounts at sites in East Crete, it is worth noting that Mohlos' nearest neighbors to the west, and that is the site of Halepa, and to the east, the site of Mesorahi, both consume large amounts of calcite tempered pottery. The presence of cooking, transport, and serving vessels in granodiorite fabrics as well as the imports from the Mesara and or the south coast, mainly fine decorated wares, are in accordance with what we know from other sites in Crete, such as Petras and Livari. The same is valid for the predominance of the burnished ware and the non-calcareous fabrics. 
However, what is missing at present from Mohlos are the calcareous fabrics used for fine decorated wares that we see in sites like Petras and Livari. In conclusion, we return to the theme of pottery technology in times of crisis, asking if any of these changes in pottery production and exchange can be attributed to the social, political, and economic changes witnessed in early Minoan I to early Minoan II Mohlos. For starters, it may be useful to consider the problem in two chronological parts, EM1 and EM2A. The evidence from Mohlos suggests that the earliest settlement was probably located in area D2 that we presented today. The stratigraphic sequence offers a rare opportunity to examine an early Minoan gateway community from a domestic perspective. We think of it as the younger EM1B sibling of final Neolithic early Minoan 1A Kefala Petras, recently published by Papadatos and Tompkins. Local pottery appears to reflect the conscious effort of producers and consumers to use a recipe, the one with the biotite mica, not commonly found at contemporary sites in East Crete. These differences are significant and reveal both the variability and complexity in early Minoan pottery production and consumption and possibly off-island relationships. The sudden disappearance of these habits in the subsequent phase shows how susceptible these traditions were to the shifting political relationships during the early Minoan I to IIA transition on the island. The most significant involved the adoption of new shapes for cooking vessels, plates and tripod cooking pots, with new heat-resistant fabrics produced by potters working in the region of Gurnia and Prignaticos Pyrgos. These changes hint at political and social transformations on multiple levels that could be interpreted as forming a crisis for local inhabitants. As we have already pointed out, the appearance of this broader network of pottery exchange in the Mirabello in early Minoan 2A forms part of a wider trend seen on Crete, which clearly indicates the strengthened ties between sites in the region in a pattern that would continue for the rest of the Bronze Age. Operating below these obvious political and economic shifts were more subtle but no less significant cultural changes related to cooking traditions, like stewing and frying, which highlight deeper social significance of this realignment. Reviewing this process at sites along the south coast of the Isthmus of Ierapetra during the prepalatial period, widely observed similar changes in pottery consumption at sites like Myrtos Furnu Korifi and Myrtos Pyrgos, with increasing numbers of Mirabello imports in early Minoan 2A and again in early Minoan 2B. Among the important factors for this increasing regional interaction is simple demography, or what anthropologists define as a stable breeding population of 500 to 1,000 individuals. Given the small size of prepalatial sites identified on surveys in this part of Crete, Wildlaw suggests this process would have required groups of up to 40 sites to interact with one another for marriages. In this light, the new evidence from Mohlos allows us to consider one last question whose topic appears well suited to the aims of this workshop, even if we cannot provide a definite answer. Was it possible for local potters to bring about these changes in response to the shifting needs of local consumers, or are these changes instead hard evidence for the arrival of new producers and consumers? The continued production of local metamorphic fabrics in phases one, two, and three provides some evidence for the former hypothesis. The shift towards new methods of food preparation and consumption was largely traced through imported materials, but did the pots come with new people or instead reflect the appearance of new political and economic networks? Since cooking habits are often associated with women's roles in household, it may be worth considering the possibility that the appearance of new cooking shapes in early Minoan to a Mohlos followed marriages between families at Mohlos and Gurnia, which might explain the appearance of smaller numbers of imported cookwares in phase two than phase three, and this pattern, uh, as this pattern developed and strengthened over time between these sites. And there you see the bride with a dowry coming with vessels on the donkey. Of course, a more aggressive model 
could also see the, over the overwhelming number in phase three as a sign of the arrival of much larger numbers of newcomers, but we would need to take a much more detailed statistical approach to the material before reaching any such conclusions. For now, we believe strongly that the ceramic material from phases one, two, and three offers a new window into this dynamic period of Cretan prehistory, which Renfrew so aptly labeled the emergence of civilization. Thank you for your attention.